What's up YouTube, Jay Dill here. So this is a PowerPoint presentation that I have presented at multiple churches and it is on the three topics that I believe contain the best facts that support creation and are not in support of evolution. And there I go over some facts that evolution would say are definitive proofs of evolution and I'll go over why I don't believe that's necessarily true. So the three points are abiogenesis, genetics, and the extreme complexity that we find in life. First off, abiogenesis and biogenesis. Abiogenesis is meaning that life cannot arise from things that are not living, and biogenesis means that life can only come from life. Like beget life. Like. Um, so first off, in dealing with origins of life, not you know, evolution of life, but rather chemical evolution. Uh, we have to look at what they, uh, what scientists believe, uh, were the primordial conditions uh, present on the Earth. So chemical evolution is uh, supposed to have happened around four billion years ago, when the Earth was devoid of oxygen. It was a very reducing environment. Um, the only problem with that, though, is that without oxygen, you don't have ozone. And without ozone, you don't have protection on the Earth's surface from the very damaging ultraviolet rays of the sun. Um, supposedly, once photosynthetic bacteria or protobacteria evolved, they began producing oxygen, and that allowed for f further and more advanced life forms to occur. But the problem is, Newer evidence shows that the Earth was not quite so reducing after all. So these chemicals cannot form in, in an environment that has oxygen present because it oxidizes the chemicals, it destroys them. So the only plausible explanation which has been proposed for the chemical evolution uh, of, of the, the building blocks of life would be the hydrothermal vent theory. But the problem with that is if something forms miles down underneath the ocean in a very different environment than what uh, we experience here at the surface, the question of how does that organism or pre-organism, if you can call it, uh, you know, protocell, bacterium, whatever it looked, would have looked like, how does it make its way from hydrothermal vents at the sea floor to the surface and become multicellular that's it's a very good question uh, Stephen C Meyer um, who studies physics and earth science and has a PhD in history and philosophy of science was quoted as having said that DNA is the most densely packed and properly assembled piece of information known in the natural world and he went on to say that without DNA there is no self-replication but without self-replication there is no natural selection so you cannot use natural selection to explain the origin of DNA without assuming the existence of the very thing you're trying to explain this is a model of DNA it's con composed of uh, pyrimidines and purines uh, you have uh, adenosine that's A to T and uh, or not, yeah, A to T and C to G adenosine or no, adenosine <laughs> adenine to thymine and guanine to cytosine those are the building blocks of DNA DNA is helical in structure which makes it much more stable than RNA uh, in addition um, you know it, it's just held together by hydrogen bonds it's uh, but yet it's 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 stable enough to maintain stability in a living organism but flimsy enough to be unzipped if you want to use that word so that it could be copied and read and proteins produced from it highly uh, I don't want to use the word evolved but highly structured piece of information alright so Stanley Miller was a scientist who attempted an experiment to try to prove that using 
the primordial conditions that were found present in the earth or theorized to have been present then um, you know with different gases uh, in the atmosphere uh, and, and lightning as a catalyst or an energy source that you could produce small organic molecules now he did succeed in producing small organic molecules this was his apparatus uh, in a gas chamber he put methane ammonia hydrogen gas and water. He had electrodes to simulate lightning. He had a condenser to make sure that the droplets that were formed condensed in the trap in the bottom and a heat source to keep the whole thing running. It was a closed system however. Um, now in the bottom he he did, he ran this for I believe a week or two and at the end of the test run he found small organic molecules but there is a concept or a, a state in chemistry in which chemicals can be. They can be, they are stereoisomers and they can be found in either the D and the L form. Now a stereoisomer is a non-superimposable mirror image. They're like your left and right hand. You can put your, your thumbs together and your your hands are mirror images of each other but if you try to lay thumb on the other side of your hand, you, you'll never be able to get um, an imposable image. So, or a superimposable image. Anyway, so the DNL were for, found in this experiment. Now, there's a problem with that because all living organisms that, all sugars that are produced by living organisms are the D form of the isomers and all forms of amino acids in living organisms are the L isomers and when an organism dies if their their proteins will at a, a given rate and it, it's affected by heat and light and other factors but they the L form of these amino acids will always interconvert to the D form uh, they, they the entropy <laughs> causes this over time so when each of these separate amino acids are contained within a living organism, they take the form of a levostereoisomer or the L configuration. At the time of death of the organism, these L configured amino acids interconvert to the D configuration. It leads to racemization, which essentially is just a ratio or a mixture of the L and D forms, and the rate is affected by different variables. Um, and scientists can use this, forensic scientists can use this to determine the point of death of an organism based on how many D configured amino acids are in an organism because they they can extrapolate based on the location uh, time, well the location and different environmental factors how long an organism has been dead based on how many of their L amino acids have switched over to the D conformation <clears throat> Dean Kenyon, who is an evolutionary biologist, was quoted as having said, we have not the slightest chance of a chemical evolutionary origin for even the simplest of cells. Further experimental work found that amino acids do not have the ability to order themselves into any biologically meaningful sequences. Now, although he is an evolutionary biologist, and I'm sure he would highly disagree with most of what I believe, he can even see that based on facts alone it is highly improbable that the first proto cells could have formed. Also in the Science Times we see everything about the origin of life on Earth is a mystery. The chemistry of life is the first nightmare to explain. No one yet has devised a plausible explanation to show how the earliest chemicals of life might have constructed themselves from the inorganic chemicals likely to have been around on the early Earth. The spontaneous assembly of small RNA molecules on the primitive Earth would have been a near miracle. Now keep in mind, they have to form small RNA molecules that could self-replicate and then to they have to be protected somehow uh, most likely by a, bilip, um, a phospholipid bilayer and eventually would have to convert to DNA which is more stable to prevent mutations uh, that, that just seems highly unlikely due to simple chance and based on what we observe 
So one of the theories, which is not a really popular theory, but I'll consider it or talk about it, is panspermia. The idea is that the seeds of life came to the Earth on comets, asteroids, etc. Somehow, somehow got here from other planets or other areas of galaxies of the universe. Uh, the only problem with that is if it couldn't arise on the Earth, how did it arise on some other foreign planet? Um, it's just, yet again, it's just a theory, it's just a mystery, more like a hypothesis because a theory has to have evidence backed up towards it, behind it. So the next topic, genetics. This is a mitochondrion. <clears throat> this is the powerhouse of your cells. This is what makes everything about your life possible. It produces ATP, which is the main energy molecule of living organisms. It's what we use to walk, to breathe, to digest food, etc. Everything that requires any bit of movement or energy, this guy is doing that for us. And because he is so highly specialized and crucial, he has his own DNA. That's very important. So if you, you may or may not have heard of mitochondrial Eve and why chromosomal Adam, but they are very important. Mitochondrial and Eve, um, it is, uh, has been found that all modern humans are descended from a common female ancestor. Now, evolutionists would say that it was just an ancestor population, a group of reproducing people um, that you know, it's, it's separate from other populations and that perhaps the other populations were killed off, but I would contend that it was one woman. And her date, her age was dated at between 120 and 140,000 years ago. Um, now, chromosomal Adam, as he's been named, uh, is, and it's really a misnomer because it wasn't Adam, it was Noah. We'll get into that, but, um, supposedly originated somewhere in Africa and they found that all modern men descended from this one man um, and his age is dated to have been about 60 to 90 thousand years ago now you may be asking why is there such a difference between her age and his age well we will go over that so let's do the math according to newer theories or newer calculations of the genetic clock it would place Eve at being 6,000 years old and Adam or Noah at being 4,500 years old because according to mathematical calculations particular scientists came up with uh, they were saying that the clock may actually be 20 times faster now they have denied the claim they've said obviously obviously we don't think that she was 6,000 he was 4,500 years old but I just find it interesting to note that creationists believe that the earth and thus the creation of, creation of Adam and Eve was around 6,000 years ago and would they believe that Noah would have lived about 4,500 years ago. Uh, so it's, is that coincident, coincidental? I, I don't think so. So here are some of the problems that they found with a molecular clock. And by the way, the way that they calculate this clock is they compare the rates of mutations uh, and the number of mutations in an organism uh, and they compare it to what they believe to be known rates and based on the number of mutations they can extrapolate how old something is. So new, newer studies show that, that not only the mother's mitochondrial DNA gets passed on to the offspring in some cases. Typically when a mother bears a child, it's just her mitochondrial DNA, not the father's, that's being passed on to the child. But that's not always true in some cases. Uh, the rate of mutations are not always constant. Of course, your environment can affect the rate of mutation. And the rate of evolution is generally larger than expected, which has raised the question of how reliable the molecular clock is, or indeed whether there is a molecular clock at all. And like I said, studies found that using the new clock, and of course they they immediately threw these results out because they they did not believe that it could be true. Using the new clock, Eve would be a mere 6,000 years old. Other problems with the um, genetic clock: 
Despite the booming amount of sequence information, molecular timing of evolutionary events has continued to re yield conspicuously deeper dates than indicated by the stratigraphic data. Essentially what that means is the dates that they have come up for organisms based on where they find them in the fossil record are younger than what they're finding uh, with uh, the, mito the mitochondrial clock. So let's let's go back to that topic. Uh, you know, I or the question I brought up a little bit earlier. Why is there such a big difference between Adam's or Noah's age and Eve's? Let's see, let's see if the Bible has an explanation for that. So all mitochondrial DNA that we it was was inherited from Eve. All humans today, although you know the mitochondria has it's mutated over time, all of our mitochondrial DNA was inherited from Eve. But when uh, there is a male offspring that is produced, it gains an almost identical copy of the Y chromosome from its father. So because there was a population bottleneck due to this supermassive flood, all Y chromosomes were inherited from Noah. So Noah and his sons all pretty much had the same Y chromosome. So there's been less time for genetic variation to occur in, in men than there has in the whole of the population of humanity because all, of, all humans alive today got their mitochondrial DNA from Eve. All males today got their Y chromosomes from Noah. Evolution says that there should be one mutation uh, in every 600 generations of an organism, of uh, humans in particular, but creations, uh, creationist figures show that one, there should be one mutation in every 40 generations. And according to these figures, that's this would line up more with what we actually find. So also, uh, geneticists have traced all humans alive today back to four gene pools. Now a gene pool you can consider it, let's say that there is a, there's a family living in Europe, there's a family living in Canada, there's a family living in South America, and there's a family living in Australia. Each one of those is a gene pool. They are a reproducing population, but the thing is, all it takes to reproduce are two people. On Noah's Ark was Noah and his wife, that is one gene pool, and his three sons and their three wives, that is three more gene pools. That is exactly four gene pools that were found on the Ark, and the amount of variation we see in genes today lines up with this perfectly. Uh, evolutionists claim that there was a bottleneck around 70,000 years ago due to a mega volcanic eruption, and if you remember, they have the age of, uh, I'm going to say, not chromosomal Adam, but Noah, at between 60 and 90,000 years ago. That's right in between, right, right around the time when they say there had to have been a massive extinction. Is that coincidence? I don't think so. According to evolution, only 2,000 people remained after this mega volcanic eruption. But here's the problem. If humans have been around for 70,000 years after this, there should, should be more genetic variation than what we see. And here's another crucial problem. Um, according to growth theory, a population should double regardless of famine, disease, what have you, should double every certain amount of years. Within 70,000 years, this earth would not be able to withstand or to, to hold as many people as should be on the earth today, but here we are. Now it makes much more sense that if it, there's only been around 4,000 years since this population bottleneck that you know the population doubling every year is going to fit up pretty closely with what figures we see today with the world population. So there were four gene pools on the ark and there's been just enough time for the variation in people's genes that we do see. Rapid speciation, right, yeah. Rapid speciation of blind fish in my opinion is a good example of why genetics is not good proof for evolution. So they took these blind cave fish who 
do not produce eyes, they can't see, they live in completely dark environments, they don't need eyes. Now supposedly it took millions of years for them to lose their eyesight, to lose the ability to produce these eyes. So they did an experiment. They took young eyeless fish that had lenses implanted in them from the same species of fish that lived, were living at the surface who did have eyes. Eight days later, the blind fish seemed to be regrowing eyes. After two months, they had a large restored eye with a distinct pupil, cornea, and iris. In addition, the retina of the restored eye showed rod photoreceptor cells. Millions of years of evolution gone in eight days highly improbable and this experiment goes to show they did not lose the ability to produce eyes the switch that turns on the eye production during the development of this fish you know as an embryo was turned off just a switch was turned off that's all it was it did not take millions of years rapid speciation of organisms is a really good explan uh, really good indication that evolution did not need millions of years to occur and if they don't have millions of years they don't have anything because according the, to their stratigraphic data the earth is millions well not mi the earth itself is billions of years old so this is a photograph of this blind cave fish as you can see it has you know a little nodule there that perhaps uh, as a resemblance of an eye, but it, it has no eyes. It doesn't need them. What's it going to be doing with eyes? It can't see anyway. There's no, there's, there are no photons to recept at that depth uh, in the dark. And if it did have eyes, if it bumped into something, it's more likely to get an infection. infection. So, you know, natural selection. This was more beneficial for it to lose these eyes. So what they found is that when they took a lens from these fish that were at the surface, the same species, just you know, a little bit different, um, slightly different mutations, you could put it that way. The lens acted as an ad inducer, so wherever they implanted this lens on the eyeless fish, it would actually grow an eye there. Um, if they put it on their backs, it would grow an eye there. So, hi, um, you know, genetic mut mutations are a loss of information. Uh, a good example would be. Um, if I took a phone book and we had, we're looking for Sally, S-A-L-L-Y. Now, I, I mutate her name and pretend it's genetic information and I say S-A-L-L-E-Y. It still sounds the same, but if you're looking for Sally, S-A-L-L-Y, you're not going to be able to find her now. Although we gained information, it's the wrong information which proves, demonstrates, that the, the type of information, the order of information matters just as much as how much there is. And the chances of a, a random chance mutation causing a beneficial um, adaptation in an environment without interrupting or disrupting the rest of an organism's development or lifestyle is astronomically unlikely. and that had to have happened countless times for evolution to have led to all the organisms we see today. So another good example that evolutionists try to quote as definitive evidence that we as humans evolved from apes is the fusion of our chromosome number two. These little red marks represent telomeres, they are the ends of your DNA, and the blue represents the centromeres, they are the middle parts of your DNA, they, they are tightly wound, it's, well, they, they it has the kinetic core, etc. But in chromosome 2 on humans, two telomeres, two sections of telomeres have been fused together. Now, they say by comparing these sections of chromosomes to apes, they see a, a very um, very close similarity between the sequences and they say, well, you know, it must have mutated, or uh, not mutated, but it must, these must have fused together and this is what led to, possibly led to humans because once these fuse, you have to have, um, you know, another organism with that same fusion in order for these to um, to cross over 
during uh, gamete and egg, you know, during fertilization. Now it is most likely that Noah uh, already had this fusion, or possibly Noah and his wife. It's possible that before the flood, multiple people had already had this fusion, but they they were all weeded out. We all have gained this fusion because of the bottleneck. So it's supposed to be the fu fusion of chromosomes 2P and 2Q in humans and 12 and 13 in chimps. But I put forth that evidence it is evidence that humans diverged along a different line than apes because it's found in humans and it's not found in apes. So either the apes that we diverged from supposedly who also had this fusion either they all died off for unknown reasons and we have no evidence of them or it never happened. And newer findings when you compare what they used to call junk DNA which they're actually finding it are the control switches of the DNA. They control how the DNA is read and how uh, translation and uh, transcription is is going on. New findings show that apes are more like 90 percent similar to humans not 99 percent. Now that may not, 9 percent may not sound like a whole bit different but humans have 3 billion base pairs of information in their DNA so 9 percent difference is about 300 million base pairs between humans and apes you still don't think that's a whole lot, it is. Humans share 75% of their DNA with worms and 50% of their DNA with bananas. What does that mean? That means that similarity of DNA does not necessarily mean common descent either. So what would it take to take ape an ape to man over time? There's just way too, ma too many changes. You'd have to have anatomical restructuring you would see a serious decrease in bodily hair in humans and an increase in pubic hair and if you ever have ever seen an ape up close you will see they have a, uh, pretty much a lack of armpit and pubic hair but humans on the other hand have all of that. Uh, evolutionists have theorized that maybe this hair was became ornamental in time in a way to demonstrate uh, sexual maturity uh, that you know once you're growing pubic hair and and underarm hair you are of the sexually mature age to be able to reproduce so a lot of change in the anatomy of between apes and humans uh, not to mention facial features if you look at apes they have a much more pronounced jawline they need it for muscular attachment um, they have to chew some pretty heavy things um, well, they have to do a lot of heavy chewing on what they're eating. Um, it's theorized that that humans would have lost that muscular attachment for more cranial capacity to have larger brains, more uh, mental capacity, uh, <clears throat> and upright posture from bowed legs. If you ever look at the skeletal structure of an ape and compare it to human, you will see why apes walk the way they do compared to humans upright and and forward posture speech ability you know you can teach an ape a few little things here and there and yes they they can communicate with each other but you're never never going to be able to teach a, a, an ape french it's just it's not possible uh, and an astounding increase in cognitive function would be required to take you from an ape to a human and the kicker is all of this would happen have to happen by random chance processes and one study of miRNAs expressed in the brain found that 51 of 447 new miRNAs that have been found were distinctly human and 25 were only found in the chimp so we find few, uh, quite a few distinctions between apes and humans so do human races exist? they do not and uh, I, I will get in debate after debate with people who are racist and who try to justify their, uh, their hatred towards people of different colors and what they consider to be races. Um, 
we are all homo sapiens if you want to be more specific we are homo sapiens sapiens there used to be homo sapiens and neander neanderthalensis is is a good example uh the the neanderthals as they were called but they were human too they were just a different breed of human if you can use that term um uh, Charles Darwin, who wrote on the origin of species, um, you know that that particular piece led to an increase in racism. Um, it's interesting to note that the percentage of genes that's responsible for the differences between facial characteristics in humans makes up less than 0.1 percent of the genome. That's three million base pairs out of three billion. It's not a whole lot. We are human. We should treat each other thus. Mutations and evolution. Lee Spetner, who has a PhD in physics at MIT and taught information and communications at John Hopkins University, said, But in all the reading I have done in life sciences literature, I have never found a mutation that added information all point mutations that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information and not increase it. Also, the mutation must also be compatible with the development of the rest of the organism. Only then will it be propagated by natural selection. There would be little selective advantage in forming a long beak if, in the process, the tongue was lost or the ears failed to develop, and even small changes in their genetic properties are likely to result in disaster. So, in debates with atheists and evolutionists, uh, I've had many of them say that God is unimaginative, so let's go over some reasons why he's not. There are no less... Oh, and the reason that they used uh, that example is they said, well, the genetic code is universal, so God, you know, it's just, he's unimaginative. Well, it's, it's the same as a computer program or software or uh, an operating system. Windows XP is, it's, it's the same on every computer, but to say that it's highly unimaginative, I mean, think of how many years went into making that system. Uh, just because you use one system to make multiple things doesn't mean it's unimaginative. It's how you recombine and make those things. So, a parasitic roundworm has no less than 13,000 protein coding genes in it. And there's up to 46,000 protein coding genes in rice alone. Now, the interesting thing about that as well is that's not the junk, so called junk DNA. It has more DNA than that. We have muscle, nerve, and Schwann cells, um, all of which are highly specialized for the particular job they're trying to perform. Uh, this is a picture of a smooth muscle, and this is a picture of a nerve cell. As you can see, there's a, an, a distinct difference between the two, and it's because they serve a very specific function. Another interesting thing to note is that homologous structures and this is an example of homologous structures, you know, the, the phalanges of a human, the phalanges of, uh, of a dolphin flipper, a bat wing, uh, well, you know, the, uh, I can't even think, but the, the bones of a, a cat leg. All of these are color coded according to what they are homologous to, but these are homologous structures in different animals but these structures, the growth of them and development of them, are controlled by different genes. Different genes coding for the same exact type of feature in an organism. Does that mean that God's unimaginative? I don't think so. We also have very, uh, they're, they're very distinct cell types. This is a great diagram of just all the different types of cells we can see uh, underneath the microscope. In a vertebrate, there, uh, there are more than 200 distinct cell types and they're plainly distinguishable and many of these types of cells certainly include under a single name a large number of more subtly different varieties <clears throat> I just put this on here because uh, it's pretty interesting uh, I thought it was kind of funny but I'm a neutrophil, I'm a lymphocyte, I'm a macrophage these are parts of your immune system they all work in tandem and they work beautifully to destroy invaders that would try to kill you. 
So human leukocyte antigen, um, which is produced from you know, on chromosome six, um, it encodes for the MHC or major, histo major histocompatibility complexes, uh, those proteins for cell recognition. They're like your, uh, for the MHC class one, um, is responsible for transplantation problems. If you don't have the same uh, blood type, for example, uh, you can, it, the wrong antigens on that will cause clotting and other problems. They also will signal your T killer cells uh, to come and kill invading bacteria, viruses, what, what, what have you. Uh, MHC class two, uh, is your T, T and B lymphocytes. Uh, your T helper cells will essentially put a flag on a problematic uh, invader uh, bacterium, for example, and then your B lymphocytes come in and your macrophages and they just they gobble it up, they dissolve it. And then your MHC class three proteins or complement proteins, uh, pretend, pretend you're a bacterium and these proteins come up to you, the first one uh, <clears throat> was going to land on your cell membrane and then the rest of these complement proteins connect to it and then they just open a hole up in you and all your guts come out. That's essentially what that does. I don't find that very unimaginative. So let's go over some more prob problems with mutations as a way for evolution to occur. But genetic mutations are seldom beneficial. Uh, sickle cell anemia and um, as, as funny as it is to me, has been cited as a good example of beneficial evolution. It's only beneficial if you're living in an area where malaria is prevalent because it does provide some protection against malaria. But in all, every other case, though, it leads to blood clottings, severe pain, multiple different uh, symptoms. So it, it's not beneficial if everybody on the earth had sickle cell anemia right now I don't think any of them would say yeah this is beneficial this is good uh, cystic fibrosis um, it <clears throat> provides protection from vib uh, from cholera uh, vibrio cholera uh, the mutation is only a recombination or mistake of the existing data that we see you know, go back to that phone book example and this disease um, can protect people in mosquito ridden areas from malaria but although all of these mutations I will say it did not create a new organism it just changed a few things in an organism and they say well it's, this is just change over time but these are not the kind of mutations that uh, that I think evolution should be citing as beneficial find you know cite me an example where something mutated and it gave them uh, you know, a tolerance to vibrio cholera and didn't cause some sort of pain or disruption in the other functions of the body. There are more than 19,000 known disease traits. Um, some of the recessive traits uh, where you have to have two recessive uh, alleles would be hereditary hemochromatosis, Werner syndrome, which causes premature aging, X-linked color blindness and albinism. And dominant diseases are things like Huntington's disease, Marfan syndrome, trisomy 18, and porphyria. Um, I've had doctors tell me that I may possibly have Marfan syndrome because my my arm length is uh, my wingspan is actually longer than I am tall, uh, among some other things, and it's a con connective tissue disorder which can cause, in severe cases, can literally cause your aorta to pop off the top of your heart and you die within a matter of minutes from internal bleeding. All of these diseases are caused by mutations in the genome. Gene syntony. Humans, chimpanzees, and rhesus monkeys all have matching codons. This was supposed to be evidence for evolution, but my argument is that just in the same way a car can be built uh, many different ways as long as it has a battery, a gas tank, an engine, etc. It's using the same basic parts, but it can be built different ways. It's the same thing with humans, chimpanzees, and rhesus monkeys. We are built similarly in anatomical structure, and in many other ways to those particular organi organisms. We're all primates, uh, we're all mammals, and 
obviously our genes are going to be similar to them, to theirs, if we're built similarly. So that's not necessarily an indication that we were descended from them. It's just an indication that we are similar to them. Other gene, uh, gene similarities. Family resemblances are also often found among genes coding for proteins that carry out related functions within a single organism. Uh, yet again, it's the same principle I just mentioned. So viruses and retroviruses. I hope you enjoyed this picture. I love it. It's pretty funny. Um, they have a t-shirt of this if you guys want to go buy this. Anyway, <laughs> uh, ERVs or endogenous retroviruses have made their way into um, the human genome. Um, the insertion sites are the same across many different species including humans, chimps, gorillas, orangutans, gibbons, old world monkeys, and new world monkeys. Um, new evidence shows that ERVs are not junk DNA, they are mobile elements which means they literally um, at will will pick, pick themselves out, out, out of your DNA and move themselves to another spot if they feel like it. What's really interesting about this is they actually play a role in the regulation and expression of genes. Um, humans and, and primates are built similarly, and what they found is that uh, the insertion of endogenous retroviruses are not always random. They, they prefer specific sites in different organisms. Who's to say that these didn't these didn't uh, infect an organism, a uh, primate, a, a monkey, ape, human, what have you, in one particular part of the DNA and then move to uh, another part of the DNA and, and when we observe them they just happen to be in a similar uh, location. They are mobile elements, they can move. Sexual selection, meiosis, uh, and mitosis. Meiosis is the production of sperm and egg uh, in sexually reproducing organisms. Um, this is the process if you want to freeze and then look over it. Uh, oh, that is, yeah, that's a pretty good diagram there. Crossing over increases genetic variation. Um, it does this by reshuffling the genes so that uh, you're less likely to have uh, genetic uh, I don't know if you have a problem with your genes, when you do the crossover it, it it's less likely to amplify that and for that reason genetic recombination is the best design. Mitosis is the process of cell division. It's the same thing that's used you know when you're you, you scratch your skin, your skin cells will undergo mitosis to replace that the missing layer of skin. Uh, it's involved in the growth of an animal as well. Um, so, so here's some examples of sexual selection. Uh, the pe peacock. This is the male. Usually in nature the male is more flashy. He has to try to attract the attention of the female. So there's the peacock and here's the peahen. Um, so the best display gets the best girl. Um, and evolution can explain asexual reprodu reproduction, i.e. binary fission, the you know reproduction of bacteria, uh, hermaphroditic reproduction like flatworms, but it <coughs> has a very difficult time explaining sexual reproduction. Um, mutations in the genome are very seldom. Uh, according to one figure, you're looking at one in ten thousand or one in one hundred thousand copies. So every time DNA gets copied there are many mechanisms to prevent uh, mutations from occurring and even if they do occur there are many checking mechanisms but sometimes they slip through. So um, in every one uh, for every DNA bit of DNA that's copied after you know 10,000 to 100,000 tries there's going to be a mutation. That's just a set rate. So seldom are benef uh, mutations beneficial. And fertile organisms yielding male and female characteristics independent of each other through mutations is strictly, uh, it, it's, it's really stretching the truth. It's strictly uh, mind boggling to see that happening on its own. Um, and if, if you had two 
organisms of the same species, if one evolved, let's say, you know, male characteristics and another evolved uh, female characteristics, how do they find each other? How do they figure out that, hey, this and this goes together and th this is how we can produce offspring? It's just astronomically uh, low, the chances of that happening by random chances. If you if you mate a horse with a donkey, although they can have offspring, the offspring is typically infertile. Now, creationists would say that these must have both uh, diverged or speciated from a, a one common ancestor. So that's why they're able to produce an offspring, but they have diverged so far that now that offspring would be infertile. A donkey and a zebra will also produce an infertile zonkey. Um, just more you know, examples of how even closely related species, um, if they are too far diverged, they still will produce something that is infertile. So what does God say about reproduction? He says that animals reproduce according to their kinds or their uh, baramens, respective genuses and species. Genesis 124 says, And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, and each according to its kind. So let's get into this third topic, the extreme complexity that, uh, that we find in even the simplest of things, and why, in my opinion, this is one of the best evidences against evolution, because it shows, according to evolution, a smaller genome is more energetically beneficial. It takes less energy to copy DNA if you don't have to copy as much of it. So let's get into some amazing things that we see in nature. The bacterial flagellum in E. coli. The, this flagellum, which is essentially what it uses to move, um, this here is the phospholipid bilayer, and there's actually two of them here. You've got a, a sandwiched uh, peptide, uh, mem well, not membrane, but you have peptides in between these membranes. Anyway, um, you have these little flage uh, flagellums or flagella that are embedded in the bacterial membrane. These things twist around so rapidly that it will actually project or move a bacterium through whatever medium it's in. Now these little guys will spin at 1,666 revolutions per second. To put that into maybe a little bit more perspective, that is 99,960 revolutions per minute and they're designed much in a way like an outboard motor. <coughs> now, evolutionists have said if you take out 40 of, of this uh, apparatus's 50 parts, you have a type 3 secretory, or secretory system which, um, you know, the, bu the bubonic plague was caused by a bacterium that, that uh, had this secretory system. What it would do is it would uh, open up the cell membrane of whatever cell it was attacking and uh, inject digestive proteins right into that vic the victim cell um, and they had they th so they theorized that you know those 10 as it take out 40 of its 50 parts so the 10 parts would you know lead to the secretory system but the problem is let's say you started from a secretory system how do you get from a secretory system to something as far advanced as a flagellum and if you ever uh, you could go online I believe Nova made a video um, demonstrating how this flagellum is brought is is produced it is insane it is actually produced from inside the cell and the proteins come up through let's call this the tail or the, the filament and it it, it co they combine on on and up and on and up and on and up so this is a highly specialized thing very un very unlikely that it was just produced by random chance and uh, in comparison, a uranium gas centrifuge, which is used to uh, concentrate uh, uranium, only um, the maximum that it can spin is about 11, uh, 1,167 revolutions per second. 
compared to the 1,666, or 70,000 RPM compared to the 99,960 RPM. So the bacterial flagellum it can move faster than any man-made thing that we have been able to concoct so far, um, except for uh, this thing. We have found uh, we have been able to make a few things that, that can spin faster than that, but I mean you have to think how, how far in the making our technology has come. The amoeba, single-celled organism. Uh, the, the amoeba is one of the, the few um, microorganisms that you can easily see um, with a microscope. You can see many different parts to it. <clears throat> the amoeba has more DNA than humans. The well-known example of the unicellular amoeba dubia with a genome 200 times larger than that of humans demonstrates that mere DNA length does not determine an organism's complexity, nor does it determine functionality. Obviously, um, you, would, you would imagine that this, uh, this amount of DNA, all of it's required. Uh, they're still doing research on it, but I mean, from what they found, a lot of this is, is, is duplicate DNA. So, according to evolution, anything that's duplicate and not needed should be weeded out. Um, this is one of the simplest organisms, yet you can see how complex its DNA is. Darwin's finches, as he sailed the seas on the Beagle, um, he noticed that these finches on different islands had different beak lengths, shapes, sizes, etc. So he um, theorized that each one had evolved to meet its environments. Now I would agree with him in terms of each one of them did change, but creationary theory would have it that they contained within their genes already the ability to form these beaks and as they became, their beaks became more and more prominent, they actually lost the ability to produce other types of beaks, or those particular genes were silenced. Organogenesis is another good example. Your nervous system, your brain, uh, photos, uh, your eyes, they're photosensitive, uh, it's your visual system, your ears, auditory system, tongue and mouth, you know, you have to be able to taste to know whether or not something is healthy or not for you. Your stomach, your heart, blood vessels, and nerves. These are all very highly specialized uh, tissues in your body and for them to have just arisen over time regardless of how much time and chance. I, I don't see this happening from random chance. Um, evolutionists have put forth that perhaps the inverted retina which humans have is a bad idea creatures such as um, you know octopus and squid they have a verted retina where the the pigments the light pigments come straight in and they hit the they hit the retina and it's okay with for them though because they're underwater they're they're par, uh, partly shielded from the the photo photons but in humans what we find is all the way at the back of the eye is the retinal are the retinal pigments and the, and the rods and the cones and in front of it are all these other uh, membranes and layers but what we do find is that these layers don't actually block the light very much at all so it does it's not a uh, less functional design and when you are considering how easily your rods and cones can uh, be destroyed when exposed to high levels of radiation, particularly particularly UV radiation, it makes much more sense that an inverted retina is a better design because the light, the, the photons have to make it through these layers first so they are depleted in energy by the time they reach, reach your retinal pigment. Um, it's a better design. Uh, this is just a, a photo of your retinal um, uh, well, of your retina essentially. <clears throat> the mammalian photoreceptor is capable of generating a measurable response to a single photon of light. Now if that is not impressive, I don't know what else is. So yet again, the inverted retina is not a bad design. If it can still pick up, uh, you know, measure an impulse from a single photon of light, it's still highly capable. 
You know, a bird's visual acuity is much greater when you think of an eagle or a bird of prey. They can see things from hundreds of feet farther than we ever could, and they can see it in, in fine detail. Uh, a fly's eye, or eyes, because they do have multiple eyes, can register uh, motion a lot better than, than humans could. Um, if you've ever watched a video where somebody is videotaping uh, something on a computer, you'll, you'll notice that in the video that the screen is flickering. Well, that's because of the refresh rate of the screen. Now the human eye cannot pick up that motion as well as a fly could, for example but it is there. The screen is refreshing at a particular rate. Cat Cats have great night vision uh, but very poor to no color vision um, and so my contention is humans eyes are a perfect blend of all th uh, three of these. We, we can sense motion well enough to get around. We have pretty good visual acuity um, and we have pretty good uh, night vision thanks to our, our the, the rods in our eyes, which are highly more uh, you know sensitive to, to photons than, than the cones are. The cones give us the color vision. So encephalopods um, inverted eyes are only better for their environment, like I explained earlier. They're much less complex, but they're about just about as efficient efficient as an inverted retina. So it really does beg the question if the verted retina works fine why did evolution need to invent the inverted retina the evolution of the ear quote <laughs> this is uh, amazing to me the human ear can detect displacements of air molecules which are actually less than the diameter of atoms wow this delicate system of levers coupled with the relatively large area of the eardrum compared to the area of the oval window result in the pressure being amplified by a factor of 40. Whenever you speak, whenever you move, sound waves are actually compressing the air molecules which eventually hit your eardrum and cause vibrations. That's why if you're out in outer space in a complete vacuum you, you can yell all you want there's no sound out there. There's nothing to vibrate up against your ears. But our ears are so finely tuned that we can do this with our ears. The tongue can taste sweet, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Um, but it can't really taste much of anything else. Most of what you taste, you're actually smelling. A uh, good example, pinch your nose and eat an onion. If it doesn't taste really sweet, I would be highly surprised. Then unpinch your nose and be overwhelmed by the pungent odor. <laughs> uh, in your nose there are more than 10 million chemoreceptors, uh, or in other words chemical receptors to pick up uh, different chemicals. And there are hundreds of distinct groups and based on which chemicals are um, affecting uh, or triggering different chemoreceptors at that time you can you can get uh, different pairings of smells different types of smells um, and there are approximately more than uh, there's about 10 different 10,000 different smells that you can smell so what would instigate evolution to develop these receptors where they previously did not exist and place them all in a centralized region You like that DNA? <laughs> if all the DNA in your body was put end to end, it would reach to the sun and back over 600 times. And the sun is close to 93 million miles away from our little planet. So that is quite some distance. And it just goes to show how wound up our DNA really is in our bodies. If all three billion letters in the human genome were stacked one millimeter apart, they would reach a height 7,000 times the height of the Empire State Building. And the human brain processes 400, 400 billion bits of information every second. But because it is so good at analyzing and weeding out unnecessary information, it only makes us aware of about 2,000 bits of that information at a time. Quite amazing. So, 
I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you have questions, if you couldn't hear what I was saying, or you disagree with something I said, or perhaps you have more information, uh, a particular page you'd like me to read, an article, anything, uh, please leave a comment down below. Uh, please rate, comment, share, and subscribe, and uh, I shall leave you with Homer's brain.